Okay, so I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, as the, uh, the big sign behind me says, this is basic theology, uh, which is uh, pretty much as it is, uh, you know, as it sounds like. This is um, uh, studying theology in a, in a very basic format, as I was telling some folks beforehand. You know, that, like the book that you have, um, Know What You Believe, by Paul Little. Uh, we're out right now. You can always, you know, if you've got Amazon Prime, you can always get it on Amazon Prime in two days. I don't know how long it's going to take us to get it. It didn't take us too many days. Did you already talk to Vinny? Okay. Yeah, okay. I couldn't get a hold of him, yeah. All right, it's all right. So we're going to be ordering some more books, so we'll have them there soon. Uh, if not, you can always just jump on Amazon and get it and, you know, get it in a few days. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really good book because it's simple, um, and it's easy, it's easy to read, but it covers all the, all the things that we need to cover. It doesn't get overcomplicated, and it, and it very much mimics sort of the, <clears throat> the pattern that, that, we, uh, that we take here. The, um, we may not be reading, you know, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 in that order. We may be jumping around a little bit, um, but follow along, you know, jump, read the class that we are um, that we are going to be, uh, I mean, read the chapter for the class that we will be teaching in the following week. Like, if you, if you haven't already, make sure you read the first chapter, which is Bibliology. <clears throat> um, again, great thing about this book is it's going to be easy for you to catch up if you haven't gotten it. You know, it's not, I mean, each chapter might take you 20 minutes, a half an hour to read. It's really, it's a very... It's a very simple book to read. Um, but follow along where it says this, the Calvary class from Basic Theology, the course schedule here. Um, <clears throat> so today you can see class one, we're doing Bibliology, a little introduction as we're doing here, and then Bibliology. Uh, and then the class two, Theology proper. And I'm not sure, I can't remember now how the, how the, the chapters go, but uh, we'll go over this in a little bit more detail as we uh, as we go on today, so you know what we're, what we're talking about. But if you if you follow along, um, <clears throat> you should be able to follow what we're doing in the book. You may be jumping around in the book a little bit, but that's okay. Um, if you just came in, um, you might want to come on up, Greg, and just grab some paper because you're going to need this for the class. I'm not trying to single you out, but you just <laughs> I want to make sure you have it. <laughs> You're okay. No, you're okay. That's fine. Yes, one of each. <clears throat> um, so, you know, we can take a look at... Um, take a look at the course guide so you can see what each one of these things are. We are teaching what's called the Ten Cardinal Doctrines. Now, we're... You know, some of them we're going to be teaching two in one. Like in class four, we're going to be doing pneumatology, which is a study of the Holy Spirit, and angelology, um, the study of angels, Satan, and demons. The reason for that is, number one, this, this is, again, designed to be a... Um, it's really designed to be like a 15-week course. Um, I've condensed it down to nine I, because I wanted it to be eight, but I couldn't do eight. It just was too much material. And Christology, you'll see, soteri not Christology, but soteriology really can't be handled in one class. So um, we have two classes on soteriology. But um, pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit, we're actually going to be covering a lot of that in theology proper as well and in Christology. We'll be talking about the Holy Spirit quite a bit. Um, so... Then angelology, there's really not a, a huge volume of things to cover, so we're able to do that in two classes. And then anthropology and homardiology, which is man and sin, they just seem to go together well, unfortunately. <laughs> so it's good to teach both together. <clears throat> and, uh, and I think he has it that way, too. I think Paul Little has a chapter that just says man and sin. So, um, <clears throat> so that's what we're, um, as we go through this, Today we're going to talk about the, the Bible, um, theology proper, 
is the study of God himself. And you can see sort of the, the subtopics there. Christology, obviously the doctrine of Christ, pneumatology, Holy Spirit, angelology. We talked about anthropology and hermetology. Soteriology, salvation, soter in the Greek, salvation. Ecclesiology is the study of the church. And eschatology, the things to come or the study of last things. So that's, that's what these things are. Um, theology, and I know, I'm sure a lot of people already know this, but we'll just, all right, the blue is dead. You know, we all remember from our grade school days, ology, the study of, right? And <clears throat> theos in the Greek is the word for God. So generally speaking, theology, just in the general terms, is the study of God. And that's, that's the whole class, because everything that we're going to be studying here tonight has to do with God. You know, whether it's salvation, whether it's, you know, the Bible, the, you know, the Holy Spirit, eschatology, these all have to do with God. The difference between theology and theology proper is that theology proper is specifically, as you can see, it's talking about the attributes of God himself. So we just, we focus in on, <clears throat> um, on who God is and his attributes. And that's sort of the, the distinction there as we go through this. Um, one thing, just, just to clarify, as we, as we, uh, the approach that we're going to be taking from this class, this is not an, a class in an attempt to prove the existence of God. Okay? We sort of enter into this class with the assumption there is a God. Okay? Um, just, just like the Bible does not attempt to prove that there is a God, the Bible assumes the existence of God and teaches about him. Um, and Hebrews 11.6 tells us this. Those who, who desire to come to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You know, and that's, that's sort of the step one. If you want to know who God is, you know, the, the first step is believing that he exists, even if you don't know anything about him. You don't have to know a lot of theology to believe that God exists and and. There are a lot of people who believe that God exists. We're not even talking about salvation, but just believing that there is a God. It has to start with that, with that, that assumption because then the rest of it is just all, otherwise it's just all speculation. Um, <clears throat> now, even though we're not going to attempt to prove that God exists for the sake of this argument that we're talking about tonight, um, it is logical to assume that God exists, you know? So if you happen to be here, you just popped in, somebody invited you, and you're not sure if you even believe that there's a God, number one, you can just sort of, you know, in a devil's advocate format, just say, okay, for the sake of argument, we're going to believe that God exists. But we can even go beyond that because it's not... Believing that God exists, contrary to what a lot of atheists say, is not an illogical thing to do. Okay? Um, logic, in my opinion, logic demands the existence of God. Uh, and we won't get into it in, in, in great depth, but, <clears throat> but just a couple of, a couple of points to, to talk about the, the likelihood of the existence of God. Um, uh, one is the the concept of beginnings. Okay, we live in a in a world in a universe that all scientists would agree is 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 a, is a <clears throat> um, sort of an economy of cause and effect. Everything that we see in front of us, everything that we see happening, science says this came from this. Right, this cause this, whatever it is, even if you're an evolutionist. What caught? Well, this caused this, this caused this, this caused this. The problem we run into is you cannot have an infinite 
what's called an infinite regression of causes. Because at some point, there has to be an initial cause. At some point, there has to be the first cause, the, un, the uncaused cause. Because you, can't, you cannot go backward for eternity because it doesn't make any sense. Because you can't go backward in something that has no time limit. Because there is no backward or frontward in something in, in, where time doesn't exist. So <clears throat> you just can't, um, you can't just say, well, everything just is going to keep going, keep going. There has to be a point where there was an uncaused cause. And this is, and this is one of the problems that the evolutionists have is they get back to the, they get back to the Big Bang. That's, that's as far back as they go. They get back to the Big Bang. And you ask them, well, what caused the Big Bang? You know, and they probably will say something like, well, um, and they won't put it as simply as this, but essentially what they say is, at one point, there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. And then nothing exploded. <laughs> you know, that, you know, they, they, because they have to say that nothing existed because there has to have been you know, something there. And, and so long as there's something there, then something had to have caused it to be there. Now, they like to think that they can get out of this by saying, well, then what caused God? Well, God is different because God is intelligent. A speck of dust that they say. There's something was, another phrase that they like to use is something that's infinitely small. Another contradiction in terms. Something cannot be infinitely small. Because if it was infinitely small, it wouldn't exist. I mean, how far, how small can it get? Infinitely means it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller for infinity. You know, at some point, it has to cease to exist. So they, but they say that something infinitely small is what exploded, which they can't even explain what caused it to explode because, again, that's a cause and effect thing, and they don't really know what made it happen. But they can't even explain where the thing came from. Um, the difference is that. God is not a speck of dust. That if you do have an uncaused cause, that uncaused cause has to have intelligence to have uh, intentionally made that first cause to happen. There has to be intention. Now, everything after that can be the domino effect. But somebody has to flick the first domino. Right? There has to be intention in, in, in the beginnings of things. There has to be some kind of intention. And where there is intention, there is intelligence. And where there is intelligence, there is some form of God. Whatever you want to believe him to be, that, that logic dictates there had to be an intelligent mind that flicked that first domino. Okay? And the second thing... Is, is what we call the teleological argument or the, the argument of design. Um, and it's, it's, it's been illustrated to me before that if you are walking across the Sahara Desert and you are hundreds and hundreds of miles from anything and you come across a brand new Ford Focus... You, your mind doesn't say, well, look what rose up out of the sand. Your mind says, somebody's been here. It's not an illogical assumption. You don't know. Do you, do you know for certain that somebody's been here? No, because you didn't see them. It's a pretty strong likelihood <laughs> that somebody has, that's where your mind goes. Somebody has been here. Why? Because you see, now, if you see a rock in the shape of a Ford Focus... You say, well, that's a coincidence. That's, oh, that looks sort of like a car. Okay. We're talking about something that has design and purpose to it, that has intricacy. When we see design, when we see intricacy, and we see purpose, again, we're back to intention. Somebody made it. Somebody put it there. It's been, it's been described as the watchmaker doctrine. You know, you find you walking, you know, you're walking along the beach and you find a watch. You don't 
your first assumption is somebody made this watch. You don't think that the watch just came up out of the sand. Right? That when we see complexity and intricacy, we think design. And design means intention. Intention means an intelligent mind. And we're back to God. So it's logical for us to say there is a God. Now, beyond that, what we're going to look in, into here um, in the next nine weeks is who is this God and how has he communicated to us and what does he have to say to us? So, um, and just continuing on that line, um, sometimes we'll hear people, well, you can't prove that there's a God. Well, I can't prove that Abraham Lincoln existed either. You know, I can, I can provide evidence, right? And when we say prove, prove means, and this is just sort of a little mini apologetics session for you. Prove means it cannot be another way. Scientific proof, right? What is, <clears throat> do we have any scientists here today? What's the last step in the scientific method? Anybody know? Shout it out. Repeat, right? After you start with your, the, with your theory and you, you, you have your control and you have your, you know, all your different elements, you go through all the different steps of the scientific method. When you get to a conclusion, the way you prove it is by doing it again. That's how you can prove that it's scientifically true because every time you do it, you get the same result. Well, I cannot prove scientifically that Abraham Lincoln existed. I got a notion he did. We have enough evidence, and that's a different standard of proof. So this is sort of one of those little tricky things that people try to say to you. You can't prove God exists. Look, I can't prove you exist. You know, my eye it could be something wrong with my eyes. I don't know what I'm seeing. <clears throat> scientifically, you cannot prove that God exists. Scientifically, you can't prove a lot of things. But we're not, when we talk about the evidence for God, we're not talking about scientific proof. We're talking what's called evidentiary proof. Is there enough evidence? And there's different levels of, of evidentiary proof that we have in our own court system. Right? The highest is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which means there's no reason to doubt it, no logical, reasonable reason to doubt that the evidence is so heavy that <clears throat> you're sure that, that this is true. Um, there is, and on the other end of the spectrum is what's called a preponderance of the evidence, which is what we most like. There's another one in the middle that's called clear and convincing evidence, which is slightly more. But preponderance of the evidence is usually what we all operate on, which means more likely than not. 51%. You know, we're thinking, we're not sure about something, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to be convinced of something, and when we get enough evidence to sort of tip the scale, we go, yeah, I believe it. And this is what we're talking about. Can we present enough evidence to convince us that, um, that God exists? Um, <clears throat> so, on that basis, we, we step into this class with the assumption that there is a God, that there is sufficient evidence to believe that there is a God. Some people don't. That's their choice. You know, we believe that there's sufficient evidence to believe that there's a God. And, and what we are going to talk about here in the next nine weeks is the the basic tenets of this Christian faith that we have here. Um, and this is what I call the non-negotiables. Okay, well, this is what makes us Christians. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the variations within some of the doctrines that exist so we can look at different, different, um, <clears throat> um, different options and different things, different viewpoints that people have. <clears throat> and, and I'll gladly share with you where we stand as a church at Calvary Chapel on some of these issues. Um, some of them are, uh, they're negotiables, 
right? Um, the the, uh, the pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know why I couldn't think of the word tribulation. The pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, this church firmly believes that the, that the rapture will take place prior to the tribulation. There are a lot of churches out there, and there's a lot of good men, godly men, that don't believe that. Um, that doesn't make them heretics. It doesn't make them, um, you know, um, evil people. We just, that's not where we are. That's not the kind of stuff we're really going to focus on in this class. We're going to talk about things like, is Jesus God? You know, so certain, there are certain movements out there, uh, Mormons, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, that do not believe that. That's heresy. That, that makes you not a Christian. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and we're going to talk about enough evidence to, to uh, prove that, if you will, or to demonstrate that, uh, then, then if you don't believe that, that doesn't qualify you as a Christian. And I know sometimes they call themselves Christians because they believe he existed, but they're just believing in somebody who is either a lesser god or some kind of a, a, a you know, a godish man and that kind of stuff. Um, so what we're going to be talking about in this class are the non-negotiables. Um, what makes us Christians? Um, and what system is systematic theology is when we take these doctrines, these, these belief systems, and we sort of package them categorically. Unfortunately, the Bible, uh, I shouldn't say unfortunately, it's God's design, but unfortunately for us, God didn't package the Bible as a book on theology like the one you have in front of you. you know? And the great thing you know, that Paul Little does, he, he provides you with the verses, that say this is why we believe this, and he, and their category, you know, they're categorized into these different aspects of of uh, scripture, um, and what I'm going to be doing this class being the exception, I'll explain in a minute why, but I don't want this class to be me standing up here just throwing a hundred verses at you. Okay, we'll never get through the class. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I will have some selected verses that we'll read together, that we'll, we'll discuss, um, and then I will pretty much go through the material, and behind me will be a volume of verses that you can, you know, some people like to take pictures of it. It's also going to be online, so you can download the, the, uh, the, the PDF, and you can read it for yourself if you like, all, and, and look up all those verses so you can see how they, how they refer to that particular doctrine. I want to do that, and you don't have to, but I want to do that to show you that I'm not just making this stuff up, <laughs> that I'm getting, I'm getting this stuff. You know, when we look into the attributes of God, I'm not just pulling it out of whole cloth. I'm getting it from the Scripture. And that's why we start with bibliology. First class, you would think, okay, we're studying theology. Well, shouldn't theology proper, shouldn't the study of God be the first class we study? Well, not necessarily. Um, you know that in the world of science, physics is, is sort of the foundational science of all the other sciences. Right? It's really the first science that we should learn because it's the basis for all of the sciences. But we tend not to learn it when we, you know, maybe it's different in high school now, but um, <clears throat> when, when we were going to school, most of us were going to school, it was usually 11th or 12th grade when you took physics. Well, the reason for that is because in order to really understand physics, you have to have algebra and geometry. And you, you, you know, you don't get algebra and geometry, you get algebra and geometry in your first couple of years of high school, then it's okay to take physics, right? So you end up taking like biology and chemistry first because you don't need the math for it. Well, by the same token, none of these doctrines make any sense if we don't understand what the Bible is. <laughs> we have to start with, well, how do we get this information? How do we know who God is? How do we know who Christ is, the Holy Spirit, angels? How do we know all that? 
from the Bible. So we look at the Bible first and say, okay, what is it that we believe about the Bible? And it seems a little self-serving because what we believe about the Bible, we find in the Bible. So it does sort of sound like a circular logic, but we're going to but what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the reliability of the scriptures. Can they be trusted? Can we, can we look at them as, as a trustworthy uh, source of information? <clears throat> so start with some basic stuff, how the Bible is broken down. Okay, just some general information about the Bible. And again, these, all these slides are going to be on the website. You can, you can you know... Um, Download them as a PDF and take a look at all of them. Okay, 66 books. Again, we were talking before the class. We do not include the Apocrypha. If you grew up in a Catholic faith, as I did, there are a handful of books in the Old Testament that they call the Apocrypha, which just means hidden. Um, some of them are weird. Some of them are good. Some of them are good books. First and Second Maccabees, there's nothing wrong with them. There's just historical books. They're just not canonical. They're not written by the Holy Spirit. They are not inspired of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we, we know that because they were never part of the Hebrew faith. It's, a, it's in the Old Testament, which, you know, is the foundation of our faith as, Christ, as Christians, is the Old Testament. And um, the Tanakh, which is what the Jews call the, the old, what we call the Old Testament, they call it the Tanakh, those apocryphal books were never in there. They weren't added until about the 4th or 5th century AD that the church added them and it wasn't until Martin Luther that they were taken back out uh, because they never existed in, in the Jewish faith. So we look at 66 books, 39 old, 27 new, uh, over 40 authors and when I say authors, I mean there's one author, the Holy Spirit but um, authors in the sense of the men that penned it um, Prophets, kings, priests, farmers, tax collectors, fishermen, scholars, physicians, you know, an assortment. It wasn't just all religious men, so to speak. It wasn't all priests. Uh, it, was, it was from the entire spectrum of society, okay? Uh, the course of, of time it took to write it. Old Testament, about 1,100 years. New Testament, about 100 years. Written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Old Testament in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek. Um, portions of the Old Testament were written in Aramaic. Uh, a good portion of Daniel, some portions of Jeremiah, um, written in Aramaic. Aramaic was a, a sort of mongrelization of Hebrew with Chaldean or Babylonian when they were in captivity for 70 years, uh, very much as, as Jews have done over the nearly 2,000 years that they were in exile after 70 AD, um, you know, one of the languages that sort of emerged as a Jewish language was Yiddish, which was a combination of Hebrew and German. And, um, and it was an attempt to preserve their language and also be in the language that they were in. And the same thing happened when they were in Babylon. In Babylon, their language, the Hebrew sort of morphed into this Aramaic and they... Uh, and Hebrew really sort of died during that period to the point that they, um, around 120, 130 AD, uh, BC, they translated the Old Testament into Greek because that was the language of the day, and the young people didn't know Hebrew. Hebrew had died by that point, and nobody understood Hebrew. So they translated the Old Testament out of Hebrew into Greek so that they could understand. It's what's called the Septuagint. Um, but those are the languages, and there's the Septuagint right there. I'm sorry, 250 B.C. Um, by A.D. 367, those were the 66 books that were in the, accepted in the Bible. Um, like I said, by about the end of the 4th century, they had added, I think it was Council of Carthage in 397, that they added the, the Apocrypha into it. Um, the Vulgate, which is the, um, the Latin translation of the Bible, 382 by Jerome. Uh, the chapters were added in about the 13th century, 
and the verses were added somewhere around the 16th century. So we hear Pastor Bill say, well, you know, don't, this, is a, this is an unfortunate chapter break. He'll say something like that. You know, this is, you know, remember that the chapters, the verses and chapters were added later. They were added by man. So anybody who, who tries to use some of this stuff about the chapters and the verses meaning something spiritually, man added them, they're fine. They're, I'm, we're glad that they did because it makes it easier for us to find things. And that's why they put them in there. So we would be able to study and be able to turn to and know where we're going. Um, but they were not, the chapters and verses were not in there. The only exception I can think of is like Psalms and Proverbs because they were sort of separate little things. A Psalm is a Psalm and a Proverb is a Proverb. So those, those had their separations. But even the verses were not added until later. Uh, and, and this is the Apocrypha. These are some of the books of the Apocrypha. Um, some of them, like I said, some of them are, are weird as... Some uh, additions to Esther and Daniel. One is called Susanna and the Dragon. Uh, there's some, yeah, there's some. Baruch was actually the scribe that wrote Jeremiah. Uh, he was he was Jeremiah's um, uh, what's called, amanuensis. He was his guy. He was his scribe that wrote down. He was actually the author, the one who wrote the book of Jeremiah. I mean, Jeremiah dictated him what to write, but he was the he was the hand that wrote it. Uh, but apparently he wrote some other stuff, and somebody thought, oh, that should be in the Bible. Well, no, if it wasn't there, if God didn't put it there, we don't add it. It's just like we know that <clears throat> Paul wrote at least two other books. He speaks of another letter to the Corinthians that we don't have, and he speaks of a letter to the church of Laodicea that, that he wrote that we don't have as far as we know. Um, why aren't they in the scripture? Because God didn't want them in the scripture. And that's just, you know, uh, God would have preserved them. God would have, would have um, had them available when they were going through it. And, and we may get into sort of the process that, that went into that, but, uh, but not tonight. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yes. He didn't write them. <laughs> they were. Yeah. 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 He wrote. He wrote the. Yeah. He wrote the first five books. The the important thing to remember is, um, and we'll get into it in a minute, is um, we don't have any original documents. We don't have what's called the autographs, okay, what, what these men wrote. We don't have anything from the original writers. Everything we have is a copy. And we're going to get into, well, how do we know if it's reliable? Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But a further breakdown, just, is just so you can see the, the breakdown of the, um, of the Bible as we have it, right? We have the Pentateuch, the first five books. We have a historical section. Then we have the, what's called the wisdom poetry section, Major prophets, minor prophets, and as, as Pastor Bill mentioned when we started Isaiah, um, major prophets just mean they're bigger books. It doesn't mean they're more important prophets. It's just the books are bigger, so they're called the major prophets. These books are smaller, so they're called the minor prophets. Now, this is how the Jews organize their Bible. This is the Tanakh, okay? You have the law the prophets, and the writings. That's important because when you hear Jesus speaking in the Gospels and he says, when he says things like the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets, what's he talking about? He's not talking about the law and the prophets. He's talking about the Bible. He's talking about their Tanakh, the scripture. Okay? It's the, it was the law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, so they just, they broke it down a little more simply than we do. The only sort of exception that we have in here is we put Daniel in with the prophets. Uh, I mean, in with, the, with the right. No, no, we put Daniel with the prophets. The Jews had it under the writings, you know, because it's a historical book. So they just saw it, saw it as that. Well, when Jesus called Daniel a prophet, well, then we are going to put Daniel in with the prophets. So 
you know. Um, but um, this is how they had the Tanakh organized. The writings were just all the historical and the, the poems and songs and, and, um, and uh, the poetry and wisdom writings were all together. So that's, the, that's how the, the Jewish Bible was structured. New Testament, Gospels and History, the Pauline Epistles, the general epistles and revelation uh, as the only uh, book of prophecy. Okay. Now, this is the point I'm getting to. We have this Bible that was handed down to us. How do we know that it's reliable? Okay. Uh, part of it is just faith. We have to believe that can God protect what he has written? Certainly. Uh, but beyond that, let's just look at how how man gauges the reliability of an ancient writing, okay? And the, the two factors of gauging the reliability of an ancient writing is the, the time span between the time that it was written and the time that of the earliest, what's called extant, which means existing, copy that we have. What's the oldest copy that we have and when was it written? And what's the time gap? The shorter the time gap, the more reliable it is. You know, so if if somebody was going to uh, write about Abraham Lincoln, we'll go back to Abraham Lincoln. Someone's going to write some history about Abraham Lincoln. They're going to try to find as much information from the mid to late 1800s as they possibly can. You're not going to be looking into the 1920s or the 1950s to get the most reliable information about Abraham Lincoln. You want to be as close to the events as possible. So the time span between the time it was originally written and the oldest copies we have is one factor. The other factor is how many copies do we have? The more copies we have that are consistent, that are the same, well, then the more reliable the, the, the writing is. If somebody handed me something that said Abraham Lincoln wrote this. It says who? Right? Well, I can prove that it was, it was written around the time of, you know, it was written about eight, 1860. Okay, well, it's, that's, you know, that's pretty close. That's good. But then were copies made of this thing? You know? And, and were, <clears throat> how many copies do we have of this letter? And are any of them different? And however many copies of this thing that we have that are consistent with what you've handed me, then the more reliable, reliable it'll be. So, you know, one of my favorite examples is Homer. You know, uh, you may have read the Iliad, the Odyssey. Uh, never in doubt as to the reliability of the content of that uh, of those writings, okay? So the Iliad was written about 800 B.C., and the earliest copies that we have, the oldest copies that we have, are from 400 B.C., leaving a 400-year time span. That's about the best rating we have in this whole chart. Herodotus, who is a very noted historian uh, from 5th century B.C., uh, earliest copies, A.D. 900. That's almost 1,400 years after the originals were, were written, and we only have about eight copies. And nobody doubts the writings of Herodotus, the historical writings of, his, of, of Herodotus. <clears throat> right? You know, we can go down all of these things, 1,300, 1,400, 1,000, 400, 1,000, 750, and you get down to the New Testament, and we have fragments of the New Testament um, from around 114 A.D., which is around 50 years after it was uh, written. Uh, we have full books within 100 years. We have most of the New Testament within 150 years. We have complete New Testaments, copies, um, within 225 years of the time it was written. And we have... 5,366 copies. That's just the New Testament. You get into the Old Testament and there's tens of thousands of copies, you know, 
and um, No. Dead Sea Scrolls was only Old Testament. Dead Sea Scrolls, because Dead Sea Scrolls were not found until 1948. So these are, and, and those are, I believe, uh, they were written around the time of Christ, if I remember, or maybe just a little bit before. Um, and the oldest copies we had, and it wasn't an entire new, there wasn't an entire Old Testament's. Um, they were, they were, they was, there was a bunch of writings in there, and included in them were copies of Isaiah and I think Jeremiah and some other, some other books from the Old Testament. The big thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls was they were written somewhere around the time of Christ, maybe a little bit before Christ. Um, the oldest copies we had prior to that were from 600 A.D. So these things were six to 700 years older than the oldest copies that we had and when we compared them they were virtually identical some you know textual mistakes and changes and things like that you know uh, typos and that kind of stuff but generally speaking they were virtually identical that's the the great thing and that's again goes to the reliability of the scriptures you know bearing in mind that when they wrote these things they, when they made these copies, these, most of them were written by monks who uh, were so tenacious that they would, they would count the number of letters across and the number of letters down because this is, this is how they wrote, okay? It was, like a, it was like columns and rows. And if anything was off, they'd throw the whole thing out and start all over again. They were, they were fearful of what God would do to them if they got it wrong. So they were, they were very um, uh, careful. They were, they, they were motivated to get it right. And um, they protected them. And they made sure that, that they were accurate. Uh, so... It's, it, it's virtually the, you know, the same sort of numbers. I mean, the span is a little, is a little more, um, uh, the, it's, it's not even that much because, you know, you've got the, we have the, we have the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is not an entire Bible. It's just some of the scriptures. And those were written about 400, three or 400 years after the, um, after the Old Testament was written, the last books of the Old Testament. Let's say Isaiah. We'll pick Isaiah. Isaiah was written about 700 B.C. These things were written maybe about 100 B.C. to, you know, first century A.D., so say 700 years, still comparing 1,400 years, 1,000 years, and the number of, of, of copies that we have runs into the tens of thousands. So it's the same, the same thing, the same principle works out, you know, and um, Josh McDowell, uh, he has a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and he's got all these numbers in here, and he has them in, in greater detail to show you that, you know, this is just sort of a, a slice, a cross-section to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about the reliability of the scriptures and how it compares to other works of antiquity. It just doesn't. It, it so far exceeds the standard that anybody places on uh, the reliability of, of writings of antiquity that um, even by man's standards, it's accurate. And it's, well, it's reliable. Let's just put it that way. They would have to call it reliable. Um, now, when we, oh. what happened, Tony? I lost my. Can you take a look and see what happened? Um, there are three elements when we talk about understanding the scripture. 
uh, three elements that come into play. Thank you. Revelation. Inspiration. And... Illumination. Thank you, Tony. Let's see if we can get. Oop. Why does it disappear after that slide? I thought I had another slide. I'll leave that up there. <clears throat> um, okay. So, Revelation. Okay, that's the first step in, 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 uh, in the scriptures, revelation, which means, uh, in, in the apocalypse, we've heard this word before, it means the unveiling, the rolling back, the throwing back of a veil, you know, the revealing, the unmasking, right? It's making known what has, something that has been concealed, something that has been hidden, making it known, uh, and it could not otherwise be known unless it was unmasked. You know, it has to do with what, what God wants to be known. This is, this is God revealing something to somebody that there would be no other way of knowing. Now, we have general revelation and we have special revelation. Okay, general revelation is things like nature, logic, conscience, history. These are things that reveal the existence of God. We look at nature, and just like we spoke earlier, I, go, I look at a tree or I look at... You know, you, you watch ants and how they work. You see, you know, there are things in nature that we marvel at. Not just at their beauty, but at the intricacy and the, 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 um, the intention, the design of them in nature. Again, looking at, looking at the systems within our own body and how, how exact that they are. Okay? Uh, nature, logic itself, the fact that I can sit down and reason and logic and, 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 and um, uh, intelligently parse out the, the conditions to which I can believe something or not. You know, the existence of logic. My conscience that tells me that some things are right and some things are wrong. You know, and, and even in today's society, if I don't have that, then I'm considered... You know, a sociopath. I am considered damaged. There's something wrong with me. If I don't, if I have the, if I don't have the ability to differentiate between right and wrong, and whether or not you, we disagree about what is right and what is wrong, the fact that we we have the concept of right and wrong proves that there is a law that is above me. There is something because it makes no sense that my conscience would tell me something that I disagree with. Why am I arguing with myself? Why would I be going to do something and my conscience tells me don't do that? I'm not even talking about Christians. Unbelievers. Before we were believers, we understood right and wrong. We felt guilt. We understood that when we went to do something, there was something in us that said you shouldn't do that. What is that? Where is that voice? Greg? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> you know? So these are what's called general revelation because everybody has them. From the time we became aware of our existence, we began to, know, to notice these things. Um, <clears throat> general, it's, it's received by the general population. Special revelation is more specific. Okay? The scriptures. That's a specific revelation. It is specific information. The prophets, they, they came out and they said, this is the, thus saith the, the Lord. Right? This is what the Lord is saying to you. The Lord spoke to me and I'm speaking it to you. And then the um, greatest example of special revelation that we have is Jesus Christ. And we can read in, in uh, Hebrews 1, 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past 
to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Through him also he made the world. So Jesus is the revelation of who God is. <clears throat> and, and it is uh, the revealing of something that was not known before. Okay, now we believe that revelation ceased in 96 AD. Okay, when, when the last book of the Bible, the book of, Re- of the revelation of Jesus Christ was, was completed, we believe that's it. There is no more, God is not writing more of the Bible anymore. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why we get concerned when people say they call themselves a prophet. We believe in the gift of prophecy, which means just this is what the Lord says. And, you, and the gift of prophecy today is when somebody is, is being given a divine gift and opportunity to share what the Lord is telling them, but it is backed up by what is in this book. Now, if somebody is telling you, I'm a prophet, and I say this, and I say, well, where is it in the Scripture? And they go, well, no, it's not in the Scripture. God is telling me directly. We don't believe that. We believe that God has closed that revelation. Because if, if not, then, hey, anybody can say whatever they want, right? And, um, and where does it end, ultimately? You know, people can just say, oh, the God told me this and God told me that. And, you know, this, there has to be a, a controlled collection of what God has revealed to us. So it has to be consistent with that. <clears throat> um, now, some people use that to say things like, well, miracles don't happen anymore. God is, God is not doing miracles anymore. Uh, we don't believe in the, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. No, we don't say that. All we're saying is that there's no more revelation. The first one, there is no more revelation. Now, we sometimes use that word, and it's fine. You know, words are kind of thrown around. The English language is always, always falls short of its proper use. You know, we can say, God revealed something to me. What we really mean is that he illuminated it. But for the sake of this class, we're sort of differentiating. Revelation means something that comes directly from God. Like Paul said, you know, he said, By the, the, uh, because of the revelation that was given to me, God was revealing things directly to the Apostle Paul that he was writing down. Okay, and as the next step is inspiration. When God takes that revelation and causes somebody to put it, put it down and he covers it as they're writing it down. Okay? In 2 Timothy 3, a verse we're all familiar with. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. It doesn't mean that God breathed on it. It means he breathed it out. It is God breathes. Inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. Right? And then Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's inspiration. That's the process by which this came to be, was through inspiration. That God breathed on it. God protected it as they were writing it. Um, they were not automatons. Okay? They weren't dictating. They weren't like, what was that again, God? I didn't hear that. Well, it wasn't like that. And they, weren't, they didn't just get possessed and just start, you know, writing like some, you know, some possessed typewriter. Uh, they, they wrote. They wrote what they were, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write. And God protected what they wrote. And so 
there's another term that's very important when it comes to inspiration. I'm afraid I'm going to go right off the edge of that thing one time. Verbal plenary. That's an A. Uh, verbal plenary. Plenary just means full. Verbal is word, which means we believe that the Bible is inspired down to the very word, not just the thoughts that were conveyed, but that each word was chosen by God. That's why this is important. Because what we believe is that this is what was inspired. In the original language, in the original Greek, in the original Hebrew, Aramaic, what God, the words that God chose in those original languages is what was inspired by God. Okay? God did not breathe on any translation. We have wonderful translations. We need translations. I can't read that. Okay? And I actually can read some Greek. And I can't read that. Okay? And I'm sure nobody in this room can read that. Okay? So we need it in our language. And um, just as the, as the, the uh, Hebrew scholars translated the the Hebrew text into Greek so that people in the next generation could read it, we have done the same thing. The Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, regardless of what you think of Jerome and what he wrote, the purpose of it, anybody know what Vulgate means? We get, you know, we get the word vulgar from it. It really just means the people, the common people. It was written in the common language. The Greek you know, there's, there's two kinds of Greek. There's this classical Greek, which Homer wrote in, and other Greek scholars wrote in what's called classical or high Greek. The Bible was written in what's called Koine Greek, which we get the word koinonia from, which means common. You know, in some places in the Bible, the word profane is the word koinonia because it's, it, it means common. The, you know, they, they used to think that the, that the Bible was written in a, a very high and holy Greek until they found it as graffiti on the side of walls. It was the common Greek. So the idea was that the Bible was written so that everybody could read it. So Jerome wrote, he translated it because people didn't speak Greek anymore. Only the priests spoke Greek. Only the high holy men could, could, it could read the Bible. You know, it's like the Quran today. You know, they're not, they're, if, you have, if you go down and get a copy, go down to Barnes and Nobles or somewhere, get a copy of the Quran, or if you have a copy of the Quran in English, that is blasphemous to a Muslim. The Quran can only be read in Arabic, Period doesn't matter now you know in particular you know, if you're living in Saudi Arabia that's fine right you speak Arabic if you live in Turkey and you're a Muslim you can't read your Bible you can't read your Quran you can read it but you have no idea what it says because they don't speak Arabic in Turkey well the Bible was not written that way the Bible was written so that everybody could read it and it was written in a common language and it's been translated because it's meant for everybody to read it and, but we need to know that those translations are just that. They are translations. And there is no such thing as a perfect translation. Is anybody here that speaks another language fluently? Nobody? Wow. That's many people. Oh, there we go. She speaks another. What do you speak? Greek. Greek? Oh, wow. Okay. Here we go. Maybe you can read that. <laughs> um, so I don't, I speak some French, I don't speak it fluently, but I've, I've learned enough to know that things, some things just can't be translated. Some things do, or some things don't translate easily, particularly when you get into things like idioms. And one of the French idioms is, um, <clears throat> it's, 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 
il fait un temps du chien, which means it's weather for a dog. Okay? We, now, if I was going to translate that, if, I'm, if this person was up here and I was a French translator translating into English, and they wanted to say that it was just really lousy weather, and they said it was weather for a dog, I would translate that it was raining cats and dogs, right? That's a reasonable thing to do. If, I, if I'm here in front of an American crowd and I say it was weather for a dog, they'd be, <laughs> what does that mean, it was weather for a dog? You know, if you're French, you know what that means. If you're American, you may not understand that. And there are some that are even more difficult to understand than that. You know, they have, <laughs> they, uh, you know, like we have one that's funny. We have a thing, hey, I could do that with my hands tied behind my back, right? Well, they say, I could do that with my fingers up my nose. <laughs> That's a French saying. I could do that with my fingers up my nose. Um, so things don't always translate properly. So that's why it is important that... Now, we have great translations. And the, the thing that I handed out to you that fell on the floor for me, this one here, gives you a good... These are all English translations and gives you a good idea of what we are looking at when we're talking about translations. And we'll just, you know, we'll sort of talk about it quickly. Um, there are some, there are three levels of translation. Sorry. Um, there is what's called word for word, there is thought for thought, and there is paraphrase. Now, word for word is... We're going to find a word. Whatever that Greek word is, we're going to find an English word that fits that word. You can't always do that. You do the best you can. That's why, you know, Bill will sometimes say, see that word that's in italics in your Bible? It's not in the original language. Because they're trying to make it easier to read. Because if, sometimes if that word's not in there, it's very hard to, you know, to, to figure out what's, you know, how it's saying. And that's why those those word-for-word -word translations, you, if you look in the second column here, which is the reading level, they're always going to be higher. Okay? Now, the Amplified is, to me, is more of a commentary. It just takes all the Greek and just throws... Because, you know, sometimes a word may have three or four different meanings in the Greek, and the, the, the Amplified will give you all four meanings. You know? Um, <clears throat> And um, so it's a little tough to read. But if you look at the King James, the NASB, uh, yeah, the New King James is really 8th grade level, I guess. I would have thought it was more than that. King James is like 12th grade. A lot of that is be just because of the, 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 the King's English. It's, a, it's, it's a becoming a little bit more antiquated, the language, the, the, you know, the, the English that it was written in. Uh, the NASB is, is sort of famously awkward uh, because it's very accurate. And if you're going to be very accurate, it, it can be a little awkward to read. So, that, so then they thought up the idea of a thought-for-thought thought Bible, which is, okay, let's not be overly concerned with the exact word that's there. Let's just make sure we're conveying the thought that's in there. And that's books like the NIV and the um, New Living Translation. Um, the, the Contemporary English Version. You can see the ESV, that's a word for word. Um, the message is what's called a paraphrase. That's like... Um, uh, Good News for Modern Man was another one. Uh, the original um, um, Living Bible. Some of you may remember the, the Living Bible. Before they came up with the New Living Translation, which was an upgrade, the Living Bible was a paraphrase. And that's just sort of, well, we know the thought that's trying to be said here. What's a, what's a real colloquial and common way to say that? You know, and... There aren't that many bad translations. I mean, translations that I would say, just stay away from it, don't ever read it. Uh, you know, the, the, the New World Translation, which is the, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, uh, something like the Neuter Bible, some of those that are just heretical, stuff like that. Um, 
For us, I would personally stay away from a paraphrased Bible. You know, the message, um, good news for modern man, uh, the living Bible. You know, if it's for a child, fine. But if they can read something a little higher, it'd be better. The closer you can get to the original language, the better. Um, my only rule is use the Bible for what it's, what it's intended for. You know, you, 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 you don't, you know, you don't use the back end of a wrench as a hammer. We do, but it's a bad idea. You know, it's a bad idea. You know, you, you don't, you know, don't use, <clears throat> um, you know, sometimes you, you use a flathead screwdriver that's small enough that you can maybe use it in a Phillips head. You may regret that choice, <laughs> right? Use the proper tool for the proper job, okay? If you're going to study the Bible, do not use a thought for thought or what they call a dynamic equivalent. The NIV, um, New Living Translation, anything in there that says thought for thought, you don't, if you're going to study the Bible, you don't use that because you're going to look up a word in the original language and you're not going to find it there because it's not there, okay? Uh, you're going, if, if you're going to just, you want to just sit down and you're not trying to study, you just want to read through, particularly historical books, things like that. You just want to read, you just want to sit and read it. Then the thought for thought Bibles are fine because that's what I call the Bible from 30,000 feet. You know, you're going to get a big picture. You're going to get a general overview of what's going on and you can read it quickly so you can get a good grasp of it. You know, sort of the Bible from 30,000 feet. You look, you're going to be looking up and, okay, you can, get, you can get a good overall grasp of it. But if you really want to get down to the nitty-gritty and understand God's word, word-for-word word translations are always going to be your better choice for studying the Bible. So that's enough about that. That's, that is inspiration, you know. And God used these men. He covered their words. He protected it. Some of it was direct revelation, like Moses and, and, and Paul. Um, some were just witnesses. Some of them were just writing what they saw in the Gospels and the book of Acts. Luke was just writing what he saw, right? He wasn't getting any revelation from God about this. He was just writing the events of what happened, the things that Paul said. But God protected his hand as he was writing it and kept what he was writing to be the truth. Some uh, got their information through eyewitnesses. Luke. Luke was, you know, to, to write the book of Luke, he wasn't there. He went to the apostles. He went to different people and asked and, and interviewed people and got it. But again, God protected it. Okay? Um, that's inspiration. Lastly is illumination, and that is the personalization of God's word. That's what we get. We don't get inspiration anymore. And again, you can say, oh, it inspired me. That's fine. But when it comes to the biblical, the translation of, of, of biblical truth, we don't receive inspiration. God is not breathing on anybody to write more stuff. What we get is what's called illumination. As we read the Word of God, it becomes alive to us. It, he, he helps us to understand what it means. And if you've been um, uh, reading the Bible for very long, you realize that you can have read something a hundred times and you go back to read it again, you go, why did I never see that before, right? God just reveals it. It was like, it was there the whole time. I've read it, I can't think of how many times, you know, but that never occurred to me. That's illumination, right? That is um, what sometimes is called the rima, the spirit um, of the word, not just the letter of the word. And it is the, 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 the personalization of it. You know, Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, uh, you know, flesh and blood to Peter. Flesh and blood, blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. That was something that it just became, you know, Peter realized it and went, yeah, this is, you know, I never thought of it, but now that you're asking me, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Right? The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they were there. They knew the scripture, but it wasn't until Christ opened, his, opened their eyes that they saw it. Absolutely. It's ex that's exactly what that is. 
that is, we don't have illumination outside the Holy Spirit. You know, we can have intellectual understanding, but we'll never get the illumination is, is what, what is God saying to me? It's not just, oh, I understand that. I understand that text. It is the personalization of it. It is the Holy Spirit revealing, because the Holy Spirit is involved in all of this. The Holy Spirit is the one that is revealing it. it he, is, he is the revelator. The inspiration is the Holy Spirit speaking to these men or protecting these men as they write it. And the illumination is the Holy Spirit, you know, opening our eyes and helping us to understand it. It's it the, the whole process is, is all the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and this is where some people will say, well, it's not the word of God until it's illuminated. It becomes the word of God when God reveals it. No, it's, it is the word of God. It doesn't become the word of God. A TV is a TV, whether it's on or off. You're not going to know what's on there until you turn it on. Illumination. But it's still a TV. And the word of God is always the word of God, even if we don't understand it. If I'm not, in connect, if I'm not connected with the Holy Spirit enough to, uh, you know, to, for him to reveal it to me, it doesn't change the fact that it's the word of God. <clears throat> um, and lastly, as we, as we go through the scriptures, there are some rules of what we call hermeneutics, okay, which is another class that I've, that I've taught. comes from the Greek god Hermes, who was a messenger. Who would, I'm glad I was there, not over there when I did that. Um, you know, and he would, he would read the messages and tell the kings, you know, the, the other gods and whatnot. But the, the, the point of hermeneutics is that it is some of the rules of interpreting the Bible. Because we, the, there has to be some sort of rules that, that govern how we read the Bible. Um, the first three rules, and you guys have heard me say this before. First three rules of hermeneutics is context, context, and context. <laughs> context is everything. Okay, there are other rules, but context is paramount because what was the occasion? What is going on here? Is not only going to to help you to understand. Uh, how to understand what's being said, but it can change the whole thing of it. People often quote from, from Job, and they will quote from Bildad and Zophar and, you know, his friends. It's inspired in the sense that that's what they said, but it doesn't make it true, you know. And I don't take the words of Bildad and Zophar and, and Elihu and say, well, it's in the Bible, so it's true. No, it was said by somebody who was wrong. You know, I don't take the words of an evil king. I don't take the words of Satan. The words of Satan are in this book. You know, the context is, who's saying it? Satan. Okay, so I'm not going to accept it as absolute truth. It's absolute truth that he said it, but the words themselves are not necessarily true. So, you know, context who was he talking to? Helps us to really understand. Sometimes it's we can we can read something and say, I don't, I don't quite get what he's getting at there. Well, when you understand that at this time, you know, uh, this is what was going on, and this is what they understood, and then it helps us to understand what it is that that's being said. So context is very very important. Um, <clears throat> You know, and then, um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, no subject is a necessity of faith unless that is what is taught in the Bible. This is what we talked about a little bit earlier. You know, the non-negotiables. If, it's, if, if the Bible doesn't make it a non-negotiable, then don't make it a, non, a, a non-negotiable. You know, the gifts, the, you know, tongues, okay, which... Absolutely, you know, as a church, we believe in the gift of tongues. We believe it's for today. We believe it's of God. Uh, we believe it has its place. We don't believe that you must speak in tongues in order to be saved. Uh, 
It doesn't say that anywhere in the scripture. And Paul even says just the opposite, that not all speak in tongues. So, so it's, it's a true thing, but it's not, we don't make it a necessity of faith. Church government. Some people would tell you, no, you must have a congregational form of government. That's what's in the Bible. You know, you must have an Episcopal form of government. You must have a Presbyterian form of government. That's what's in the Bible. That's, it's, as we're hearing from Pastor Bill on, 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 um, in um, First Timothy, you know, and we're going to hear when he gets into Titus, you know, there were elders, there were uh, pastors, there were bishops, you know, overseers, there were deacons. There were some officers explained, but there was no, he didn't say, okay, here's what you do. You set up a board of trustees and you give them charge of this. And then you have a vestry over here. You know, every church sort of worked it out on their own. And you can't, you can't say, no, you're just, you're not even biblical. You're a, you're a heresy if you're not this form of government. Uh, I, we mentioned the pre-tribulation rapture, the, 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 you know, the doctrine of the millennium, you know, post-millennium, a-millennial, all this stuff. These are, these are things that we can have a certain dogmatic position on, but we don't make them an essential of the faith because the Bible doesn't make them an essential of the, fa- of the faith. Okay? Uh, another one is don't emphasize the doctrine more than the Bible does. You know, the, you know eschatology is, is, is a big part of the Bible, but it's not most of the Bible. You know, and some people, that's all they do. Sometimes they just only, that's all they want to know about is eschatology. Well, there are other things in the Bible other than eschatology. You know, uh, another example of this is numerology. You know, I believe that there's this meaning to, to the numbers. We know that God is trying to convey certain things using certain numbers. The number, of se- the number seven, completion. Number five, grace. Three refers to God himself, the Trinity. Right? There are certain numbers that, you know, um, uh, 10, I think, is judgment. There are different numbers. Four is, six is the number of man. Four is the number of the world. You know, there are certain numbers that seem to God is very consistent on. I'm not going to teach a class on numerology because it's, it's just not a major doctrine. It's not a, it's not a tenet of the faith. It's something that's there, so I will give it, give it the emphasis that it deserves when it comes up. We talk about it, but other than that, we don't. Um, you know, the gifts of the Spirit, very important. And we're going to talk about that in, the, in, in this class. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. But if we disagree on it, it's not a tenet of the faith. It's not, it's not, a, a, um, you know, it's not something that needs to be overemphasized. Okay? You balance one doctrine against another. You know, you can't... For example, one of the most controversial things, free will, sovereignty of God, okay? We take the position of both. If you take the position of one over the other, then you're not being true to the Bible because the Bible teaches both, that man has free will and God is sovereign. How do we reconcile it? I have no idea, but they're both in there. So I don't, I don't, and I, and I, and I, and I, Balance them against each other. And, and if I, if I, if another example is if I'm reading something and it seems to contradict something else that's in, that I've read in the scripture, well, then I'm not done studying it yet because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And we just need to, we need to look into it a little more and figure it out. You know, the, um, you guys have heard me say this, you know, one of Pastor Chuck's famous sayings is if the plain sense makes the most sense then seek no other sense and the inverse is also true if the plain sense makes no sense then seek another sense you know if you're reading something and you think it's it's telling you something that is not biblically correct then you need to go back and figure it out what it's saying you know and figure out what what it actually means and how it balances against another scripture you know, and, fi- and if it goes over your head, if you're reading something, say, I have no idea what this means. Then, you know what? One, a, a pastor many years ago when I was a young believer said, spaghetti on the wall. If it sticks, it sticks. Whatever doesn't stick, you'll get later. You know, just don't, don't be like, I've got to get it. I gotta... If you're not getting it, God may say, you know what? I'm not ready to reveal this to you or illuminate it to you yet. You know, I'm not ready to give this to you. So just move on. 
and I'll, I'll get it to you later. Don't, don't dwell on it. Um, <clears throat> figurative language. You know, this is an example of getting, and this is part of context too, that, you know, you read the book of Psalms. Psalms is poetic language. It's, it's songs. Song of Solomon is a poem. A lot of figurative, flowery language. You know, people say, I take the Bible literally. So, you believe that God literally has wings? He says he, you know, enfolds us in his wings. Okay, it's figurative language. God is not a bird. Okay, he doesn't literally have wings. It's figurative. Um, you know, there's a number of, and if you take a hermeneutics class, we'll go over all the different figures of speech. If it's figurative, I take it figuratively. When Jesus says, if your eye offends, you pluck it out. Unfortunately, many people have taken that literally. He doesn't mean it literally. When he says, how often should I forgive? 70 times 7. Okay, so 490 times. So I'm going to have to keep, keep count. I'll get a little clicker with me. I'm at 400 and, you know, 488, two more times and I'm done. No, it's called hyperbole. It's, say, it's using an exaggeration to say every single time, forever you forgive, right? So there's things that are figurative that we take figuratively. There are things that are literal that we take literally. In the book of Revelation, of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, it can be dicey. There's a lot of symbolic languages, a lot of figurative language in that book. Some of it we take literally, some of it we take figuratively. Some people say, oh, the locusts are, you know, helicopters. Could be, or they could be locusts. You know, some of it, some of it we don't know. You know, and if anybody says, I know everything that the Bible says and exactly what it means, run. <laughs> okay, because that person doesn't exist. Uh, uh, the Bible was written... Simple enough for a child to read and complex enough to confound the greatest mind. So, you know, there are things that we're not going to figure out. We're going to do our best. And those are the things that we don't get real super dogmatic about. You know, you don't, you don't plant your flag on whether or not it's a locust or a helicopter. That's it. If you don't believe it's a helicopter, then you're a heretic. You know, and I'm, I, I'm saying that because it's obviously untrue and it's, and it's an exaggeration. But there are some things that people will plant their flag in and it's like, why are you, you know, look, there's, there's enough of them out there that don't like us. There's no reason for us to be arguing with us. <laughs> Let's look for reasons to stick together and not reasons to, to be arguing with one another. So if it's not dogmatic, don't make it dogmatic. And the last thing, with regard to when we read something in this book, is that it doesn't end up here. You know, what I read in this book has to go from here to here, which means <clears throat> I can have mental assent. I can understand what it means. But until I put it into practice, until it becomes part of who I am, then it's not really mine yet. And this is what God wants. God wants to take, what did he say? I, I took my word and I wrote it in their hearts. Right? We are living epistles. The, the, um, <clears throat> I always liked the, that there was an old Gatorade commercial. If you remember the Gatorade commercials when they, you know, shows them, you know, a guy playing tennis or football or whatever. He's working out and you see the green droplets, the sweat. You know, you can see the Gatorade coming out, and the, and the phrase was, is it in you? Right? Well, the Word of God is the same way. You know, we want to be in it. We want to be in it constantly. We want to understand it. We want to study it. We want it so that it's coming out of our pores. You know, is it in me? Is, and, you know, and Pastor Bill talked about this. Um, I don't remember it was when. I think it might have been Wednesday night. or No, it might have been Sunday morning when he said, sometimes... You know, you've been studying the word, you're studying the word, you've been in it, you've been reading it, and you feel like, I just, nah, I nothing, I'm not getting anything. And then you, you begin sharing something with somebody, and all of a sudden, verses are coming out of you. And you're like, wow, this is really good. We're, you know, <laughs> and you're the, you're the first one to recognize, this is not coming from me. You know, I don't know where these verses are coming from. But the reality is, 
they had to be put in there first. Because you brought them in, they became part of you, and now God can use them to come out. And that's the most important thing about the scripture. And so as we, as we continue on, sure, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's what the next eight classes are about. <laughs> that's that's where you know we're setting that aside because the first non the first non negotiable is this is the word of God. Because if it's not, well then what are we doing? If this is just somebody's opinion, then what are we doing? You know, one of the most disappointing scenes in a movie I've ever seen was, how many here saw the book of Eli? Right? Good action picture. And I love the fact that here was this guy, he was going to protect the Bible no matter what. You know, and that he was going to get that Bible to where it needed to go. He was, this was a precious book. And I liked that part of it until the very end. Remember what happens at the very end? You know, he sits down by memory. He's memorized the Bible, and he's writing it, and he's, you know, and they finally they make a book out of it, and they take it, and they put it up on a shelf right next to all the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran and all the other books of antiquity. They put it on a shelf in a library, and they show all these other books. It's in there with all the other books. No, this stands above all the other books. Because this, this was delivered to us by God. And if, if, if we don't enter into the next, you know, eight weeks with that assumption, because everything we're going to go over in the next eight weeks comes from this. That's how we get it. We're not going to make it up out of whole cloth. If it's not in here, then, we're not, then it's, it's not part of our faith. <clears throat> and if this is... If this, and that's the problem we run into when people say, well, you know, I don't, you know, this particular section I don't know if I agree with. If you don't agree, if there's a particular section that you don't agree with, then where does it end? When, if we get to choose, then what's the point? Because as soon as I come across something I don't like, I can just say, I don't believe that part. You know, uh, Pastor Bill says it all the time. This, you know, you will judge this book or it will judge you. The challenge of reading the Word of God is when I read something I don't like, do I say, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not including that in the volume that's, that I'm letting in. Or maybe I need to change the way I've seen things. You know, if, if I disagree with God, and I had this conversation with, a, with somebody who was a believer who had, you know, drifted, and I asked them how their relationship with God was going, he said, well, we're not seeing eye to eye. <laughs> and my response was, well, who do you think is right? <laughs> you know, if, if, if I disagree with this, and I just say, Nah, I'm just not gonna. I'm not gonna agree with that part. Well, then I get to do it with the whole thing, and then it's. I might as well be reading a Tom Clancy novel or James Patterson novel or, you know, Irma Bombeck. You know, if, if life is a bowl of cherries, what am I doing in the pits? You know, it, I can just put this just like in the Book of Eli. I'll just put it on the shelf next to everything else. It's just a nice, another good book to read. Gives you some interesting, you know, right next to Oprah's book and. Right? Well, why not? If, if that's why there has to be that point where we say, look, this is where we get everything from. This was delivered to us by God. This is inspired of God. This was given to us by revelation. <clears throat> and then what it says is what we're going to believe. And that's, this is where we're going to draw all these other things that we're going to talk about in the next eight weeks that are going to be the non-negotiables. But the first, that's why the Bible has to come first. The first non-negotiable is... Is it from God? Because then we start talking about the attributes of God and we say, oh, I don't like that attribute of God. Well, I got it from the book. So then if you're not going to believe that, then you're not going to believe the book and you might as well just 
toss the rest of it in the, the old circular file. Any other questions? Comments? Did everybody get a, uh, a handout? Joan? I'm hoping so. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes things come up, and I, and I'll have to look at the have to sort of look at the schedule. But it, they should be. My hope is that we're going to get this done in nine weeks. That's what's on the schedule. That'll get us through. Where are we? We're at the end of February. Uh, about the middle of April or so, something like that. You know. Um, March, yeah, probably toward, toward the end of April, I think. So it should be. I'm going to try to get it unless something comes up. You know, sometimes unforeseeable things happen. Dr. Bob. That seems slow. Every book but Esther. Was it every book but Esther? Book but Esther. Really? I didn't know that. Part of every I thought a part of every book. Well, because a lot of it was destroyed, too. Yeah, yeah right. It was the, the whole book of Isaiah. What was that? Was that when it was dug up? Well, according to Jerry Brown, it was the 1950s, right? The, no, that was the uh, in the um, in the the um, what was the that book? The Da Vinci Code it started out fact, da, 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 fact, and he goes fact. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the 1950s. So much for it being a fact. I mean, that's like you can just Google that and find out the you know. <clears throat> But anyway, so that's why the book started out with falsehoods. Uh, any other questions? Yep. It is. It's being recorded. It's being broadcast live. So long as we do it from the sanctuary, we're going to be broadcasting it live and recording it. Um, and it will be available. It's actually going to be available in a couple of places. Um, on the website under media. Uh, also on our app, if you have our app, and if, if you if this is your church, if you come here regularly, I would recommend you get our app because all the stuff is going to be very easy to get to from our app. Uh, we've we've got a we've got a really super app from Subsplash that has, 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 gives you great access to stuff. Uh, but it'll also be on our website under media. Uh, it'll also be on our website under if you go on our website under ministries, and then Calvary Classroom. The videos will be available there, but also all these documents are going to be on there as PDFs plus all the slides and all that stuff is going to be on that page. The page is, the media page won't be able to, they won't, it doesn't allow me to put the documents on the media page, but if you just want to watch or listen to the, to the class, you can do it from the media page. Um, but if you want the documents and stuff like that, then go to Ministries, Calvary Classroom, and then both the videos and the... Um, the documents and everything will be on there. So, I'm sorry? The app, you mean like, how do you find the app? Okay. It, it's called, it's, it's, we don't have what's called a branded app. So our app is sort of within another app. But it is, once you're in it, it's personalized and you'll always go back to it. You don't have to keep looking for it. You only have to look for it once. It's called The Church App. Okay, and and it's it's you'll know it because it'll the, the the icon on it is a little gray cross. Once you do it, and if you're doing it now, is the best place to do it because if you're sitting in the church, it'll automatically find the church because <laughs> it goes by location. You know that your, your internet's been down for like two weeks on the Wi-Fi. The what? You, oh yeah, in you mean in the building our Wi-Fi? Yeah, we've been having an issue with our Wi-Fi. Yeah, we're working on it. Um, we had redone some things and they redid it the wrong way and they're trying to undo what they redid. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's called The Church App. It's got a little gray cross on it. When you go into it, you can, you hit enable location so that it'll keep, it'll know you're in this area and if you're near the church, there'll be a list of churches. You pick us and once you pick us, once you pick Calvary Chapel Gulf Coast, then that's it. Then every time you go back to that app, it'll just, it'll be ours. It'll be up, and uh, it's got media. It's got the bulletin. It's got the blog. It's got all. It's got everything you that you'll you'll need on there. So, anyway, any other comments or questions?